So a couple days ago, I made a video about how Jesus was a Jewish apocalyptic preacher. Since then, mythicists have making their voices very heard, both on here and Twitter and Instagram. For those who don't know, mythicism is the idea that Jesus did not exist as a historical person. I actually got really heavy into this a couple years ago. I used a lot of their arguments. But ultimately, I began to realize how grossly inadequate those arguments were, and how Jesus existing as a historic figure really is undisputable. Eh, I disagree with that assessment, but also, it seems silly to get triggered by somebody just assuming that Jesus was a historical person. For, like, 90% of the discussions that I have, I just automatically assume that Jesus was a historical figure, because... That doesn't really affect the discussion that I'm having at that moment. Unless the conversation is specifically about the historicity of Jesus, I don't really see any reason to bring it up. Well, if y'all want to fuck around and find out what Captain Dadpool's issues are with mythicism and why I disagree with him, then please stay tuned. What's up, heathens? How y'all doing? I'm the Godless Engineer, and I critically analyze apologist claims to give you the best arguments and information so that you can stand up and use your voice. Now, Captain Dadpool is not an apologist. He's a fellow atheist. But he did say a number of things that I disagreed with in this TikTok video. That's not where I want to start out first, though. First, I want to start by agreeing with Dadpool on a couple of things that he says. And then I want to get into the issues that I had with his video. First off, Dadpool does a great job of explaining what we mean by the minimal historical Jesus. First of all, when you say that Jesus existed as a historic figure, all you're really saying is there is this Jew in the first century Palestine who took on followers and was crucified by the Roman government. That's basically it. I think that that is a great description of the kind of Jesus we're expecting to find in history and the kind of Jesus that Dadpool considers to be indisputable. I do think that it's plausible that a person like that could have existed. But the real question is, what does the evidence say about this supposed historical person? Now, the next part that I want to highlight here I think that everybody needs to embrace, regardless of your position on this topic. Anyway, I'm out of time. Jesus existed as a historic figure, and that absolutely does not threaten your identity as a skeptic or an atheist. Full stop. I couldn't agree more with Captain Dadpool on the latter part of this section. Jesus, existing or not, should have no effect on your identity as an atheist. Also, I feel like it's bad form for anybody to attack somebody for just assuming that Jesus existed in history. It's just a difference of opinion, and we have a lot of different opinions in this community. I'm far more worried about the amount of transphobia that appears on my Facebook posts than I am about whether or not somebody considers Jesus to be a historical figure. Now, those aren't the only things that I agree with Captain Dadpool on, but the rest of the video has sort of a mixed bag of agreement and disagreement. Josephus, who was a Jewish historian in the first century, wrote about half a dozen other messianic figures that sound a lot like Jesus. What this means is that this motif was not all that uncommon. Josephus even mentions Jesus himself, twice, and his brother James. Of course, mythicists will turn around and say, no, he didn't, and that's kind of the problem. Any argument for the historical Jesus is just kind of brushed off by mythicists. Well, he could be talking about just general people on the internet that are having these discussions with him and are unwilling to back up their information. I encourage everybody in this discussion to back up their claims with evidence. And don't brush off arguments against your position. Take the time to really consider the evidence and the claim and then explain why their evidence doesn't convince you of their claim. For instance, he claims that there are two instances in Josephus that were refer to Jesus and Jesus's brother James. I actually have two clipped videos on my GE Shorts channel that deals with both of these references in Josephus. So I highly implore you that if you want all of the information, all of the citations and everything like that, definitely go to those videos if you want to know more. In short, critical scholars have shown that the only version of the Testimonium Flavianum that has ever existed is the one that we currently have the one with all of the very Christianized phrases in it. And that could not have been written by Josephus. The style and content of the Testimonium Flavianum are not characteristically 
Josepha. People arguing for a partial interpolation of the Testimonium Flavianum have to change the Testimonium in order to make it sound more Josephan, considering that no other version of the Testimonium Flavianum has existed, it makes no sense to me why you would change the passage to be more Josephan and then claim that Josephus wrote about Jesus. Now, there are a lot of details that I've left out of this elevator pitch against the Testimonium Flavianum, but it does show how we're not just merely brushing off this argument. We have real reasons to reject this particular reference to Jesus. The same can be said about the James reference. The elevator pitch for that reference would be that as the current text stands, it makes no sense for Josephus to be referring to Jesus Christ. For one thing, the James in that passage dies completely differently than church tradition generally envisions James's death. It also doesn't explain why a completely different Jesus is put into James's position later, when at the time it was customary to replace one murdered person in a position with somebody that they're kin to, like. Jesus been damnious. This passage most likely mentioned that James and Jesus were been damnious. That makes this an accidental interpolation where a marginal note was mistaken for a correction. Again, this doesn't explicitly state all the evidence we have to make these claims, but it does let people know that we are not just simply brushing this particular reference off. We are definitely carefully scrutinizing this section with all the available evidence. Now, I do agree that Josephus mentions a lot of failed messiahs in his works, so it was definitely a common motif at the time. I completely agree with Dadpool on this point, but I also think that it makes it harder to discern a historical Jesus. Trust me, I've had these conversations with him and I've done the research myself. I've even read the book. Well, I know that Captain Dadpool has had a conversation with me directly on this topic, and in that interaction, I directly asked Captain Dadpool after a more than an hour-long conversation about mythicism and mythicist claims, what exactly have I just dismissed or brushed off without good reason? Uh, we, we started out this with, with you thinking that mythicists just sort of dismiss things. And I'm wondering if uh, through our conversation, do you feel like I've just dismissed anything without reason? I, I don't know if without reason is the best word. I, I, It's more like you have to cling to more fringe ideas in order to make them work. If that makes sense. Like what what fringe idea have I espoused? Just uh, that, other than Jesus didn't exist. You no, know, just that um, Jesus was not actually born of a woman. He wasn't a he didn't actually like he was a flesh fleshly being, but he was created on the, in the firmament. Um, things like that that almost no scholar is going to agree with. I would need a citation for that, that no scholar would agree with that. No, almost, I, almost no scholar. Uh, you're going to well, find I, scholars that are going to agree with you. No matter what you could, again, there are atheist flat earthers. You're going to, you're going to be able to find a scholar who agrees with you. So, so why um, does it matter? Because there's always going to be people out there who want to cling to fringe theories. No, no, no. no. I mean, like, are. why does it matter that, that no, almost no scholar would would agree with those interpretations of things, even though they're literally in like, you know, documents that are, that are in the Bible. And because stuff. If, it, if it was an idea that was worth entertaining, more people would entertain it. Mm, in this particular field. I mean, do you really think so? They entertain the idea that a Jew was pinned to a stick and then resurrected. So it seems like his claim that he's had conversations with mythicists and that they've done nothing but brush off arguments against mythicism isn't all that exactly representative of reality. He seems to have a problem with the fact that most New Testament and biblical scholars won't agree with every single aspect of mythicism. Keep in mind, though, that New Testament scholarship and biblical scholarship, it's a fringe idea to consider that the resurrection wasn't a historical event. I think he's completely wrong. I think the consensus of New Testament scholars would say Jesus was raised from the dead. Mm. Um, I, because the, the vast majority of 
New Testament scholars are Christians. I mean, I'm an odd duck. (laughs) Now, that's not to say that Captain Dadpool didn't have counterpoints to my arguments. But the fact that I want to focus on here is that I did not just brush off any of his arguments against my position. I'm also very happy that Captain Dadpool has read the only academically reviewed mythicist's position. So I would assume that there wouldn't be any misrepresentation of the minimal mythicist's position in this video. I mean, he can just crack that bad boy open and confirm that he's steel manning our position. So really, I shouldn't have any disagreement with what he thinks the minimal mythicist's position is. I mean, at the very least, he should get the hypothesis correct. But more importantly, this means that he's interacting with the academic mythicist's position and not just some rando crackpots online. But still, this further confuses me because he's claimed that mythicists just brush off the evidence for his historical Jesus, which implies that we haven't scrutinized the evidence for historical Jesus yet. At the same time, he's holding an 800 plus page book that handles all of the evidence for a historical Jesus. I'm just, my mind is boggled and I don't understand. But like it or not, Jesus is better attested to as a historical figure than most figures throughout history. He didn't write down anything himself because I think for good reasons that he was illiterate, but it did not take long for people to start writing about him. Well, the minimal mythicist position doesn't require Jesus to have written anything, which I know that that's not what Captain Dadpool is saying that we are expecting. Uh, Dadpool just seems to be explaining the situation. But the minimal mythicist position does only deal with the evidence that we actually have, not the evidence that we don't have. And since Jesus didn't write anything, we don't consider that to be evidence. But saying that Jesus is better attested than most historical figures at that time is just wrong. Consider the evidence that we do have for a historical Jesus. We really only have the writings of Paul as our earliest known source about Jesus. And he isn't even an eyewitness of Jesus. Paul seems to only attest to a celestial version of Christ when he talks about his visions from Jesus, as well as other ways in which he got his information, namely through the scriptures. Paul even directly states that he did not get his information from any human sources. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Galatians 1, 11 through 12 A popular historical figure to compare to Jesus Christ is Alexander the Great, and that's because his best biography was written by Arian some 400 years after Alexander the Great's death. So, just like Paul wasn't an eyewitness to Jesus being on earth, Arian also was not an eyewitness to Alexander the Great. But do you know what Alexander has that Jesus definitely doesn't? Eyewitnesses to Alexander existing. Arian had access to accounts from two of Alexander the Great's generals. We know this because Arian has an extensive section on the sources that he used and why he considered them to be the best sources. He also discusses how he resolves contradictions in his sources. Can you honestly name another person in history that we consider to be historical for which we only have mad visions of his heavenly form to appeal to? The only saving grace for Paul is the fact that he has a lot of vague verses in his epistles that could be interpreted as mentioning a historical Jesus. But they could also work with the idea that Paul only ever considered Jesus to be celestial. Now, we will be covering a couple of Paul's verses today, But that shouldn't detract from the argument that Jesus is better attested than most historical figures. Keep in mind, though, that comparable historical figures have actual eyewitness accounts that can be used to verify that they indeed existed. And if not eyewitness accounts, then we can appeal to physical evidence or evidence from events in history that could have only happened due to that person existing. These are a far cry from just visions of a celestial person. Our earliest source? Paul. Yes, he's biased, but that doesn't mean you automatically throw it out as being 100% unreliable. If we did that with American history, we would know nothing about American history. If you have a source that's biased, what that means is you scrutinize it a little heavier. 
I emphatically agree with Captain Dadpool on this point. So it's a good thing that mythicism doesn't throw out Paul as 100% unreliable. And we deeply scrutinize Paul as a historical source. What does it mean to deeply scrutinize a historical source, though? I would think that you would want to analyze what Paul said and how he said it. I would think that you would also want to know what were the common Jewish theologies that were going around and then compare those theologies to the things that Paul is saying in his epistles. As we know, the way that people talk change depending on time period, location, and culture. It's also important to know what people of not only Judaism, but also the surrounding religious landscape believed about their reality. Now, that would be some deep scrutiny right there. I mean, it's not like we're just going to read directly from translations made by evangelical apologists, right? So when Paul says in Galatians 4.4 4, that Jesus was born of a woman, born under the law, that means he was a real person. Now, here's the mythicist argument against that. They will tell you that the word for born actually means manufactured. And they believed at the time that their Messiah was created in a cosmic sperm bank containing the semen of David in the firmament. I wish I was kidding. Okay, so let's take these claims one at a time. Strong's Concordance suggests that the word that Paul used in Galatians 4.4 4 is most commonly used to denote the manufacture of an object. Genomai is identified as meaning to come into being, become, come about, happen, or born in the sense that something is constructed. Could Paul have meant that Jesus was naturally born while using this word? Possibly. The only way that we can know for sure is to compare how Paul uses this word across his epistles, as well as how Paul talks about birth in other places. Romans 1.3 also talks about Jesus being born, but still uses the genoma. But how does this compare to Paul talking about other people being born? Does Paul use the exact same word? No, he doesn't. One caveat that I'll put here due to my recent conversation with Neil from the Gnostic Informant is that while both of these words do use the same root verb, which uh, means to be born, um, the fact that both of these words are used for very specific purposes, I think strengthens my argument against Galatians 4.4, meaning a literal natural birth. If you go to Romans 9.11, it discusses the future births of children, and it uses the word genau, which again has the same root verb, but is changed in order to give it a different meaning. Strong's Concordance defines genau as meaning I begat of the male, of the female I bring forth, and to give birth to. This is an explicit reference to natural birth as opposed to the coming into being that Genomai offers. Going back to the Galatians 4 passage, if you just progress a little bit in that section, you'll see in Galatians 4.23 that Paul is discussing how Abraham had two sons and one son was born, Genau, to the slave woman. It seems weird to me for Paul to use distinctly different versions of the same verb just a few verses apart. It seems pretty clear to me that when Paul uses genomai for Jesus' birth and genau for other births, he is distinctly choosing those words because he does not consider Jesus to have had a natural birth. This idea is parsimonious with the context of Galatians 4, because the context of Galatians 4 is an allegory. Not only does Paul tell us that he is using these women as an allegory, but also, this allegory is used to communicate how Christ's death absolves us of our sins. The concept that Paul didn't consider Jesus to have a natural birth is also parsimonious with verses like Philippians 2.7, where Paul indicates that Jesus was made in the likeness of men. This concept also coincides with Paul's idea about Adam's body in 1 Corinthians 15.45, as well as our future resurrection bodies in 1 Corinthians 15.37. This non-natural birth concept is also parsimonious with other people writing at the same time as Paul. Hebrews 2.17 was not written by Paul, but a contemporary of his. 
And it also describes Jesus's body as being manufactured using the exact same words that Paul does. So the idea that Paul considers Jesus's body to be constructed or manufactured by God is parsimonious with the rest of Paul's theology, as well as the theology of his contemporaries. Now, on to the cosmic sperm bank. What cosmic means in this particular context is just heavenly. Not only Jewish theology, but also pagan theology had this concept of multiple levels to heaven that extend from the upper atmosphere uh, all throughout the universe. And every single level of heaven seemed to house different types of divine beings. Paul himself in 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4, has a man being taken up to the third heaven where paradise or Eden is located. This notion is also located in the Revelation of Moses 37, 4 through 5, 40, 1 to 2, and 2 Enoch 8 and 9. So a cosmic or heavenly location seems to permeate Jewish theology. Now, the notion of a sperm bank is mentioned in Judaism, albeit not explicitly. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. 2 Samuel 7, 12-14 one thing that we can be sure about is that the Jews were deeply interested in reinterpreting their scriptures to be more messianic. Now, if this section was read like a pesher, it's very easy to see how some Jews would be convinced that God could scoop up the nut sauce of David and use it later in order to manufacture Jesus' body. If you think about it, this is parsimonious with other messianic prophecies that are supposedly in the Old Testament, but also what the New Testament says about Jesus, with him being a descendant of David or having Davidic flesh. This notion of God using David's nut juice to construct the body of Jesus is parsimonious with that. Even though that's not the original context of 2 Samuel, later Jewish legends actually envision demons scooping up David's nut sauce in order to create rival kings. So God collecting David's baby juice in order to create a body for Jesus later is something that early Jewish Christians would plausibly believe. And Carrier never states that this sperm bank is in the firmament. Carrier just places the sperm bank in heaven, and I sincerely doubt that God would store anything on the firmament, considering that at the time, Jewish beliefs indicated that demons inhabited the firmament, which was congruent with other religious beliefs at the time. So, everything that Captain Dadpool wishes he was kidding about is actually found in Jewish theology. Paul regularly identifies Jesus as having a body that was constructed by God, and even Jews thought that God and or demons could collect the nut juice from people while they were sleeping, including David. While this sounds ridiculous to us now, that was part of the Jewish theology at the time. Oh, and all this information is contained in Dr. Carrier's book that Captain Dadpool held up and said that he's read. So what's more likely, that or that he was born under Jewish law by a woman? I agree that being born of a woman, born under the law, is plausible. I don't know why Paul would need to say this in that section of Galatians. If he was wanting to say that Jesus was a Jew, he had already accomplished that by saying that Jesus was of the seed of Abraham and David in Galatians 3.16. But still, the minimal mythicist hypothesis does account for this being plausible. But what I feel is more parsimonious and therefore more plausible, given all the information that we've covered, is that Paul was not referencing a natural birth. And so many questions are created when you assume that he's meaning a natural birth. Why does Paul use Use a completely different word when he's referring to other births? Why does Paul seem to be only referencing Jesus as being constructed? Why does Paul refer to Jesus' body as being just like Adam's body in our future resurrection bodies? I mean, do you see how assuming a natural human birth here 
causes a lot of questions to arise for the rest of Paul's theology. I do agree that it's easier to just believe the passage at face value than it is to academically scrutinize the passage. Similarly, when Paul says that Jesus was crucified, mythicists will say, yes, in the firmament by demons. Now, this is not what mythicists believe. This is what they think Paul believed. And to justify this, they heavily rely on a book called The Ascension of Isaiah. The problem is Paul never quotes the Ascension of Isaiah. He quotes the Torah a lot. He quotes Greek literature a lot. He quotes Plato's Republic multiple times. So why doesn't he ever quote the Ascension of Isaiah if everything he's talking about is coming from that book? Well... Dr. Carrier never says that Paul got this idea from the Ascension of Isaiah. The Ascension of Isaiah is too late of a document for Paul to have gotten any of his information from. Dr. Carrier uses the Ascension of Isaiah to demonstrate that there were at least some early Christians that believed that Jesus descended from the upper heavens to the firmament, only to be killed by Satan and his demons, then to be buried, and then to resurrect absolving their sins. Now, as far as what Paul's sources were for the crucifixion of Jesus, if we look to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, we'll find that Paul only ever identifies scripture as being his source for knowing about the crucifixion. The idea that Satan and his demons crucified Jesus comes from 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 10. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages of our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 10. So, Paul attributes the death of Jesus to the rulers of this age, or the archons of this aeon. A similar term is used by Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. In Jewish theology, demons or demonic divine beings seem to have inhabited the firmament of the heavens. This is well known in the scholarship and is congruent with other pagan beliefs surrounding that area. So thinking that there were demons or evil spirits inhabiting the air or even lower portions of the heavens was a common belief at the time. But I really don't think that Paul could be talking about the Romans in this passage. For one thing, the Romans didn't believe in the Jewish theology concerning the Messiah, so why would they have a vested interest in preventing the absolution of everyone's sins? The only group that would have prevented the crucifixion considering the consequences of the crucifixion and considering Paul's theology would have been Satan and his demons. Paul consistently describes the enemies of both Christians and Christ to be the principalities and powers of this world. They are the ones that don't want people to have salvation because they want to keep this world for them. They would have a vested interest in preventing the persecution and death of the Messiah. More importantly, though, Early church fathers also interpreted Paul's words here to mean Satan and his demons. Early church father Origen in Commentary on 1 Corinthians explicitly states this. So early Christians also understood this rulers of this age to be about demons and Satan. Also, assuming that the rulers of this age are the Romans makes the second half of this passage rather confusing. You mean that he's saying that the Romans are the ones that killed Jesus, yet they also had never heard, seen, or imagined it happening? Also, how is it that the Romans killed Jesus, but the only way that it was revealed was through the Spirit of God? These are questions that assuming the rulers of this age are the Romans simply cannot answer. So, in summary, minimal mythicism never says that Paul got his information about Satan and his demons crucifying Jesus from the ascension of Isaiah. What minimal mythicism says is that 
A common belief amongst some Christians at the time was that Jesus descended from the upper levels of heaven down to the firmament where Satan and his demons then proceeded to persecute and kill him on a cross to which he was then buried and resurrected, ascending back up to the upper levels of heaven, like the Ascension of Isaiah says. And this whole idea is parsimonious with the theology of Paul. If we're looking to show that Paul could have plausibly believed this entire scenario, we would want to show that other Christians along the same lines as Paul would have also believed it, and that's what the Ascension of Isaiah accomplishes. And again, all of this information is directly contained and easily found in Dark Carrier's book, the same book that Captain Dadpool held up in the air and claimed that he has read. Like it or not, several people started writing about Jesus pretty early on after his death by historical standards. And no one was saying he wasn't actually a real person. Even opponents of Christianity, like Celsus, made fun of Christians for worshipping a day laborer who was killed by the Roman government. Didn't criticize them for worshipping someone who did not exist. Well, considering that Celsus was writing at the end of the 2nd century, and the Gospels had been in circulation for around 100 years at that point, it seems to me like that's what we should expect out of a 2nd century critic of Christianity, to assume that Jesus was historical. So the fact that Celsus doesn't consider Jesus to be mythical or purely celestial doesn't hurt mythicism one bit. I do agree with Captain Dadpool that people started writing about this supposed figure of Jesus shortly after he is believed to have died. And the only problems that I have is that there are no eyewitness accounts of him existing on Earth, or any evidence that can be traced back to an actual historical source. Paul doesn't cite any sources other than scripture and visions, and the Gospels don't cite anything other than scripture. In stark contrast to other historical figures, we literally have no contemporaneous evidence that Jesus existed on Earth. Well, heathens, that's going to be it for me today. I appreciate you watching this critique of Captain Dadpool. Like I said, I found myself agreeing with him a lot, but also, at the same time, disagreeing with a number of things that he said. I do want to emphasize that I think that it's silly to to criticize other atheists for not considering that Jesus was a mythical person or anything like that, or criticize them for not being a mythicist. Personally, I'm fine with allowing people to just assume Jesus existed for the purposes of an argument or just in general. It doesn't bother me one bit. But what does bother me is when minimal mythicism is misrepresented. That's where I have a problem. If you will, please go down below. Let me know what you think down in the comments. And hey, while you're down there, why don't you smash that like button and subscribe if you like mythicist content like this. And don't forget to stand up and use your voice. Bye, heathens. So that we, you can...